<laughs> this book, Powerless, is great. I went into it thinking, well, it's popular on TikTok, so obviously it's going to be trash, right? Like, I thought it would be soulless and bland and just following the shallow demands of a vapid audience that gets mad when they don't get instant gratification out of every book they read. And I was right. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Powerless is about a girl named Peyton Gray who has no powers. And that sucks because recently the king of the kingdom they live in, it's called Ilya or Ilya, declared that only people with magic powers are allowed to live there now. There was recently a plague which came through and killed a bunch of people, and some of the survivors wound up with powers, but some of them didn't. So now, Pat Payton is forced to pretend that she's psychic and eke out a living in the slums, until one day, she winds up saving the life of Kai, who is one of the princes of Ilya. And then she's pulled into some sort of deadly tournament where she fights for her life. You've never seen that before. Now, half the book is from Payton's POV, and the other half is from Kai's. It switches back and forth not every chapter, but most chapters, but that way we get twice as much story, so that's great. And the sequel is coming out soon, so I decided now was a good time to cover it. And I love this book. I love how every character talks like an exposition machine. They introduce themselves to the audience by saying shit like, as the daughter of a general, to characters who already know them, and therefore they would already know that information. It gives the author a chance to cram in tons of characters who are hard to tell apart, and also acts like those characters are distinct. Who needs natural world building and character development? Just saying everything you think all the time and giving your backstory unprompted is far better. I love how both the POV characters narrate exactly the same. Kai and Payton both talk exactly the same despite one being a poorly educated peasant from the slums and the other one being a wealthy prince. They both describe things the exact same, they have the exact same outlook on life. It makes their chapters kind of hard to tell apart sometimes. Now, some people might think that by having two different POV characters, one wealthy and one poor, it would be an opportunity to showcase how the two leads come from completely different worlds despite living in the same area. And that would show how they can grow and as people and learn from each other, but those people are dumb. No, fuck you, Mark Twain. What do you know about writing? I love how the magic system here has no real cost or rules. Some people have powers and some people don't, and that, that's it. If you have powers, you can use them all the time with no limits, unless somebody, they call them silencers, comes along and they prevent you from using your powers. That's their powers. They prevent others from using their powers. Now, does everyone have their own unique set of powers? No, of course not. There's about 20 different types and everybody has one of those types, you know? It would be really difficult to write more than that. And then each of the groups that has their own power has a really dumb nickname. And then I guess they just gave up after that. Hey, what, what, what's that doing here? This also allows you to introduce new powers whenever it's convenient to the story, bending the world to make sure the characters never wind up in a spot that they can't escape. I love how everyone in this book is effortlessly beautiful, even the ones that live in extreme poverty. That doesn't detract from how awful their lives are supposed to be at all. There's an obligatory ballroom dance scene where Payton is dressed up all pretty, but she looks exactly the same as she did before. Maybe you could use this as a way of showcasing how Poor people and those without powers are really no different than the people who rule over them once you scratch below the surface, but why put in effort? Just make everyone beautiful. That way the audience is sure to imagine things correctly. And that way, if someone comes up who's ugly, they know they're supposed to be a bad guy. I love how the villainous king is just a complete dumbass. After the plague comes and kills a bunch of people, leaving some of the survivors with powers, he decides to kill all of the ordinaries. And ordinaries is the term for people without powers. And you might be thinking, with mass death from the plague, his kingdom should already be in a precarious position. Why would he want to kill off all the people who make his country run? You know, people like farmers, servants, shopkeepers, laborers, carpenters, etc. Without them, things wouldn't work. And the king bloviates about how ordinaries are weak and don't deserve to live in his world like the world's shittiest anime villain. But that's the thing about anime. It always makes perfect sense and totally isn't melodramatic trash written for 13-year-old boys. A society with all nobles and no peasants sounds like it will work great. Sure, the king could just set things up so that the ones with powers rule over the rest, but that's unoriginal and this book refuses to be unoriginal. 
I guess he decided it would be better to take away all of the people who don't have powers and don't really have a way of fighting back against him, get rid of them, and then replace them with people who do have powers and make them the oppressed peasants. That way they won't have any way of ever threatening his rule or trying to overthrow him in the future. Makes perfect sense. Just have the king start killing people because he's evil and have other people go along with it because they're also evil, I guess. So he's an idiot. I love how many chapters in this book are just repeating information from a different perspective that adds nothing new to anything. You know, Kai and Payton attend to the same functions and view many of the same events. So that way we get to see everything twice. Now that may sound like a waste of time, but it's not. Seeing things from different perspectives can be valuable and enlightening. Just look at the movie The Last Duel. It's the same story told three times from three different perspectives. Now, I know Kai and Payton don't actually have different perspectives on things, but that's beside the point. Repeating info without any spin or differing narration is good. Your audience shouldn't stop and wonder which POV character they're reading about right now because none of your POV characters should have definable personalities to begin with. That just gets in the way of the wish fulfillment. I love how there's a random elite trials that a bunch of nobility is forced to compete in. You know, putting the prince in danger, even if he's only second in line to the throne, makes perfect sense. After all, Kai is just supposed to be his brother's enforcer. You know, he's the one who gets things done for his brother, or at least he will be once his brother becomes king. Him dying in the trials wouldn't cause anything bad to happen or destabilize the current reign in the slightest. It's also great that they have a generic name. You know, why go for something crazy like the Millennium Tournament or the Hunger Games or Battle Royale when Elite Trials sounds just as good? What's even the prize for winning the Elite Trials? I, I don't remember, but you know what? That doesn't matter. I was still very, very invested. I love how there's a pointless love triangle. Payton, Kai, and his evil brother who is the heir to the throne form the legs of the triangle. Kai's evil brother has no personality besides being evil, but Payton still loves him, sort of, at first. By the end, she decides that he's evil and they are mortal enemies. You might think that this makes Payton look shallow and stupid because she's infatuated with this dude just for being hot. You might think that this would be an opportunity to let Payton showcase her distrust of people with power due to the atrocities she's witnessed them commit. She could dislike both brothers at first, but then see that Kai is a decent person and fall in love with him after that while still hating his brother. But who would want to see that? <laughs> who would ever ever want to see that. No one wants a slow burn romance or enemies to lovers. They want characters to fall in love instantly while the book pretends that they're enemies for half the story. I love how the ball scene has an attack by ordinary terrorists who somehow manage to not immediately be obliterated. I love how the size of this setting makes no sense. The nearby desert is big enough to throw most of Ilya's population into to die, but also small enough to walk around to the other side while someone is unconscious. That makes this world feel tiny and artificial. And some might say that having a setting be tiny is bad. A fantasy world isn't supposed to be something that you can get lost in. It's supposed to be small and lacking in even surface level details. After all, I don't want to think about anything when I read. Next you'll be telling me that a fantasy or science fiction world that's artificial in-universe can still be expansive and cool. <laughs> I mean, come on, who would ever try that? I love how everyone has names like Payton and Jax and Kai and Andy. These names all sound like they come from completely different places with different languages and cultures. That makes the world feel big and doesn't at all shove everything into a single blob. You know, these people are all from the same kingdom, the same area of the same kingdom, but they have totally different names. There aren't distinct cultures here. There's one big culture with no actual definition or identity. That's how world building works. I love how Kai hits a wooden practice dummy with a sword. That would break the sword in real life, and uh, in most books that would be stupid, but because it's in this book, it works. I love how Payton's younger sister character literally gets her sewing hand broken by the villain to show how evil they are. Okay, you're not even fucking trying, not that you ever were, but no more pretending. This book is ass, man. Powerless is impressively soulless. It's as if the author just decided to smash together scenes from other books and then change some of the characters' names. Like, there aren't any popular fantasy books on TikTok. There's one popular fantasy book on TikTok, and it's just the same one every time. And Powerless is just that same book again. 
There's no attempt at doing anything new. There's no attempt to disguise that everything is something we've seen before. And there's no attempt to play around with new or play around with old ideas. That's why people keep describing books using fanfiction tags and page names from TV tropes. Like, that's all there is. There's no justification for the tropes or even trying to really make them work. They just sort of happen. That's why they all feel so fucking soulless. And here's the thing. I did genuinely try to give Powerless a fair shot, as I almost always do. And at first I disliked it. Yeah, for the first chunk of the book, I did dislike it, but it wasn't that bad. I truly gave up on it when I got to the part pretty early on where we learned that Kai, the main love interest and one of the POV characters of this book, participated in a genocide. Literally. I hope I can keep this video monetized. When I got to that part, I admit, I, I started skimming. Like, I did go through the rest, but I was skimming over everything. I did not read every single word in, in this book. If I missed anything important, or if I misunderstood anything, then I do apologize for getting it wrong, but I sincerely doubt that. Because again, this is just the exact same shit as before. All I have to do is think back and go, okay, what did every other popular <laughs> fantasy book on TikTok do here? And that's exactly what Powerless did. This thing truly is an air sandwich. This copy is about 500 pages. It's fairly long, but there's absolutely nothing in it beyond the surface level. You know, not in the characters, not in the world, not in anything. Everything here is either directly spoken to you in very, very simplistic terms, or it doesn't exist. And really, only one out of every three scenes, maybe, has anything important like that. Most of this book is just pure filler. And not in the sense, like, the word filler is way, way overused these days. But, so, when I say filler, I'm not using it in the sense that pe people use today, where an episode of a TV show dedicated to showing someone's backstory that explains their mindset, but doesn't advance the main story by another couple of steps, is considered filler. Like, I don't mean it like that. I mean actual filler, stuff that's just there to take up time and for no other reason. Like I said, I can just name a few tropes and you know everything about this book. But even if the rest of this book was good, which it's not, even if the rest of this book was good, it really doesn't matter when one of the deuteragonists is this bad. Like Kai is just straight up evil, but the story doesn't want to admit that he's bad. Now, to clarify what went on earlier, I did just sort of mention that he did a genocide without explaining further. Uh, his father ordered all the ordinaries, the people without powers, to be killed. And Kai is supposed to kill a bunch of them himself, and his dad and his brother do believe he's been out going out and killing people, and, but he doesn't actually do it. He's so merciful. He, he doesn't kill these people. Do you know what he does? Guess. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead and guess. Take a moment. Just think to yourself. What could he possibly be doing to save these people? He forces them out of their homes, takes them to the edge of the desert, and then throws them into the desert without food, water, or shelter. Most of them still die when they're out there wandering, but we're supposed to think he's just such a nice guy for not killing them himself. And that's DISGUSTING! Now, the United Nations actually has a legal definition for genocide, and there are multiple different acts that can be considered acts of genocide. One of those acts is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, which is exactly what Kai was doing to the ordinaries there. The Ottoman Empire forcing a million Armenians into the desert without food, water, and shelter where most of them died was an act of genocide. And Kai forcing the ordinaries out of their homes to die in the desert is the same thing. Even if they lived, even if they, they survived, but they were just forced out of the country of their birth and had to go somewhere else as refugees, even if they lived, that still means Kai and the others would have committed ethnic cleansing. Like, congratulations, you didn't do the Armenian genocide, you just did the Nakba. That means I can find you hot and not feel weird about it. Now, I should mention, though, that genocide is a legal term with a specific definition, but ethnic cleansing is not. Just, just throwing that out there. So, all genocides are a form of ethnic cleansing, but not all ethnic cleansings are genocides. Now, again, if we want to get technical and get into the legal definition of things, then genocide only covers trying to actually kill members of a national, racial, ethnic, or religious group. So, ordinaries 
who are just survivors of a plague who don't have magical powers wouldn't really fit the definition. Uh, that said, the king, you know, he looks down on them and says they're weak and worthless, so he seems to kind of be treating them like they're a pseudo-racial group or a pseudo-ethnic group. So fuck it, I think it counts. And even if it doesn't count, then this would still fall under crimes against humanity, because crimes against humanity, basically the definition of that is just we don't have a specific law against what you did, but what the fuck, dude, you need to be locked up. Like, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that is basically what Crimes Against Humanity is. Now, just to be clear, so I don't get people getting pissy at me, I'm not saying the author is pro-genocide. I just think she's stupid. Same with all the fans and the people who promoted this book. Like, you are allowed to have a protagonist who does horrible things, up to and including genocide. You're allowed to have protagonists do that. I'm not saying that having Kai be awful is bad by default. Because you could actually do a lot with a guy who starts off the book committing genocide. Like, you could have Kai be an anti-hero or even a straight-up villain protagonist, you know? Like, he wants to help the ordinaries, he starts off thinking, this is bad, I want to help these people, but not if it means going against his family or giving up his luxurious lifestyle that he enjoys as being prince, you know? Payton could start off liking him because he talks a big game about wanting to help her and others like her, but then realizes that he doesn't want to actually put in any effort and she realizes, okay, yeah, he's, he's an awful person. Or maybe Kai is just lying to himself and knows that, yeah, when I throw these people out into the desert, I am still killing them, but he just can't bring himself to do it. You know, he can't bring himself to kill these people personally. Or maybe he hates ordinaries at the beginning, but he realizes partway through the story that he was wrong and he decides to change. But, like, holy shit, like, I don't know what it is recently, but there are so many popular books, especially popular TikTok ones, from the past, like, five, maybe ten years, where characters just aren't allowed to change. Like, character development is a dead concept to them. Like, you need to allow your characters to change, and failing that, you need to acknowledge that the shitty things they do and the flaws they have are shitty. Powerless and other books like it refuse to have flawed characters that develop over the course of the story, so they just paint over the flaws or straight up ignore the flaws and pretend that they're not there. So what we're left with is these static planks of wood that are hot and awesome to begin with, and they just they never get any better than they are at the start. And they don't even change, they don't even become different over the course of the story. And here's the thing, you can have redemption arcs for characters that start off as bad, whether they're heroes, anti-heroes, villains, whatever, but you can't have a redemption arc if the book pretends that they don't need to be redeemed. Like, imagine if in Avatar The Last Airbender, imagine if that show tried to convince us that Zuko was the good guy just from the beginning. You know, like, we, we missed out on his redemption arc. We missed out on seeing his backstory where we learned to empathize with him, and that's after we've seen him as a villain for a while, and we've seen him do nasty stuff. Uh, we would miss out on empathizing with him, we'd miss on, out on seeing him go back to his father, decide he doesn't want his uh, father's approval, and then finally join Aang and help save the world at the end. If somebody like Lauren Roberts wrote that show, Zuko would just be hot and effortlessly cool from the start, and we'd have to pretend that him terrorizing innocent villagers is not actually a big deal. Like, just, it's, it's fine, don't think too much about it. And then he would join up with Aang after four, maybe five episodes, and then he'd just be a good guy after that, and we'd never, ever deal with the fact that he did some nasty stuff. You know, just give the audience instant gratification all the time, and then waste, waste the entire rest of the series because of filler. So, because Powerless, and other books like it, are allergic to actual fucking character development, or letting us feel anything at all towards the heroes except for attraction and admiration, it has no choice but to pretend that Kai murdering people is fine, actually. And even Payton doesn't seem to be that upset with him killing a bunch of people who are members of a group that she is also a member of. Like, she isn't upset at him for that. She hates him at the end of the book because she finds out that Kai killed her dad. Yeah, all those other people that he killed, that's fine. My dad, not fine. They're both disgusting people. Now, maybe this book was trying for a sort of thing where Kai was a villain and a victim at the same time, you know? Like, he does awful things, but only because he's forced into it against his will. 
the problem is that this book paints all of his actions as perfectly fine. You know, it, it paints them as being like almost heroic. Like the book wants us to think, oh, Kai is so heroic, he's doing all he can to save these innocent people. It, like that's what the book seems to think and that's what the other characters seem to think, but he's very much not. Like, he's second in line to the throne, and he's going to be his brother's enforcer, which is... I, I don't know, I guess that's supposed to be like vaguely like a prime minister of sorts. Like, he's his brother's lieutenant who actually goes out and does things on behalf of him. I, I think it's not explained super well. But that's Kai's position. He's second in line to the throne, he's going to be the enforcer, but he's not trying to stop the genocide at all. He's just prolonging some people's suffering on the off chance that maybe they'll manage to survive on their own without his help in the future. Like, if the book wanted us to feel sympathy for his position, it would have had to show Kai attempt to stop the killing at some point. Or at the very least, make it clear that he's being forced into it somehow, or that he's just brainwashed into his father's ideology. Or both, you know? Like, at first, he hates ordinaries, but then he falls in love with Payton, finds out she's an ordinary, and realizes he was wrong to hate these people. There you go, that's like an actual story with fucking character development and conflict and stuff. It, and having this happen wouldn't necessarily make us like Kai, but it would make him more sympathetic. You know, it's the difference between a teenager getting conscripted into the Folkstrom and a grown man volunteering for the Einsatzgruppen. This video is going to be hard to monetize already, I'm not explaining what either of those are. The words are on screen, look it up yourself, you lazy pieces of shit. Now, if Kai was in either of those situations, Neither of them would be good, but one is substantially worse than the other, mostly because it's being done of his own free will. And in Kai's case, in Powerless, Kai is in the Einsatzgruppen, but the book tries to make you think that he's in the Folkstrom. And it also kind of tries to make you think that the Folkstrom did nothing wrong, which, to be clear, they, they very much did. So really, this book is about a member of the Einsatzgruppen falling in love with a Jewish girl, and she's fine with him killing other Jews, but she starts to hate him when she finds out he killed her dad. For being a Jew. WHAT THE FUCK?! You know, I recently heard the term character laundering to describe this sort of thing. You know, authors just cannot fucking commit to having a character be bad. So they have them do bad things and then pretend that the bad things they're doing are perfectly fine. You know, they're... There's a substantial difference between a bad boy and a villain. You know, a bad boy is someone who says what they think no matter how others feel. They're very confident, they're passionate about their beliefs and hobbies, and what makes them attractive is that they are very authentic and unconcerned with seeking the approval of others or of society at large. What, that, that's what a bad boy is. What's not a bad boy is somebody who does sexual assault, hate crimes, domestic violence, and has anger issues. And those are all things I've seen in crappy romance. Now, the line between bad boy and villain can admittedly be blurry, but we should be able to agree that genocide is on the far, far fucking end of that line. Look, An Ember in the Ashes is not an amazing book series, okay? But it does feature a genocide, and that genocide is portrayed like a real fucking genocide, you know? It's against an ethnic group that they're called the Scholars in those books. It's, it's kind of a dumb name for an ethnic group, to be honest, but it's against an ethnic group that was already oppressed, and the Scholars were in no real position to fight back. They did have a small, weak rebellion at the beginning of the story, and the leaders of the Empire just used that as an excuse to commit the genocide, you know? Like, they're saying, we need to root out the rebels before they overthrow us. They're a threat to all of you. I'm protecting you. You know, and the scholars who were useful, e.g. the ones who were slaves for wealthy people, were largely spared from the violence that comes their way later. It's also only done because the king of the jinn wanted revenge on them. It's... look, my point is, you can understand why the rulers in that series would do a genocide, and also why the regular people of the empire would largely just go along with it. You know, they're used to hating the scholars, they're used to treating them like dirt, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. And because they are a separate people, slash a separate community, the regular people of the Empire are unlikely to have friends or families who could be targeted by the violence, so they're less likely to object to it. There is no real reason for anyone to hate the Ordinaries in Powerless. There's no history of ethnic hatred or oppression, although again, the Ordinaries aren't really an ethnic group, uh, there's no rebellion from the Ordinaries until after the genocide has already begun, so they couldn't really use that as an excuse, and there's not even really a benefit to the king or ruling classes that would cause them to support this. 
there's just a genocide for no reason. And since the plague hit everybody, it's likely that people with powers will know survivors from the plague who do not have powers, and they would probably take umbrage with the government trying to murder their friends. We see exactly that in this book. There are people with powers who join the resistance, and the resistance is clearly in a position to fight back, so why bother picking a fight? Why would you do this? It's, it's dumb for a lot of reasons. Why would they do this? Because the author has no imagination and can't think of a different conflict that actually makes sense. So, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Fuck this book, and to the people who made this popular, fuck you too. You are pathologically incapable of understanding anything that's going on in front of you. Like, you can only take in the vaguest sense of aesthetics, and beyond that, you are fucking lost. That's why the fans of this book think that Kai is hot and cool. It's because they're fucking stupid. These people would stand Hitler if he had a K-pop haircut. I'm not joking when I say that there is just some, something fundamentally broken inside their fucking brains. It's not that they don't want to overthink the media they consume, which is understandable. It's that they cannot think about it at all. To them, it's just like jangling keys in front of their face for a few seconds. Like, it just distracts them for a moment. That's all it does. Because a normal person would look at a main character in a book committing genocide and say, Hey, that guy sucks. Not, wow, he's so hot. Like, seriously, fuck you people. Seriously. Even setting aside the disgusting nature of what goes on in this book, it's exactly the same as everything you people insist on shoving in front of my eyeballs, you know? It's the same book. It's the same characters, and I don't mean the same character archetypes, I mean it's literally the exact same characters. Just copy-paste their backstory, personalities, appearance, everything. Just copy-paste it. It's the same characters. It's the same settings. It's the same pacing, or lack thereof. It's the same conflicts. It's the same writing style. It's even the same length. Like, they barely even rearrange anything. Like, it's always about 500 pages long. There's less than 50 pages at the beginning dedicated to the introduction and the inciting introduction and citing incident, there's about 30, maybe 40 pages at the end for the climax, and everything in the middle is just there. You know, there's no plot progression or character development in the middle, because in the popular TikTok fantasy book, everything stays the same from page one till the very end. After all, if a character has to grow and evolve into their final state, then the audience might not instantly love them. They might have to wait for their gratification, and that's unacceptable. Powerless is just Red Queen with a few scenes in different spots. And also it's done worse, and Red Queen wasn't very good to begin with. Like, look, people, if you're going to be reading the exact same book over and over and over and over and over again, just read Fourth Wing a dozen times. Like, it's cheaper and easier than constantly buying all the new ones that come up. Or, better yet, just try something different. Try something new. You know, try something that isn't about the exact same people doing the exact same things in the exact same way as everything else you've read for the past four fucking years. Because, here's the thing, people complain about fantasy in general being samey, but as somebody who's read a lot of fantasy, those people are ignorant. You know, say what you will about the fifth sorceress, it's a lot different than the Stormlight Archive, which is different than Mistborn, which is different than Lightbringer, which is different than the Dinosaur Lords, which is different than the Black Tongue Thief which is different than The Mocked, which is different than The Lord of the Rings, which is different than Orconomics. Like, these are all fantasy. You know, they have some similarities with each other, like, that, that's what a genre is. It's taking a certain set of similarities and deciding, okay, all books that have these are one genre. But at the same time, they're all very different. You know, they have different tones. Like, some of them are, like, lighthearted and humorous. Some of them are dark and disturbing. And, hey, here's, here's something crazy. Sometimes, these books will have different scenes in the same book that have different tones. Like, you'll have a, a scene that is lighthearted and humorous, followed by one that's supposed to make you upset and a little bit angry, followed by one where you're supposed to be sad, followed by one where you feel triumphant. Like, sometimes the tone changes throughout a book. It's not the same thing the whole time. I know that sounds weird, but sometimes that happens. These books all also have different conflicts. Sometimes it's very personal, sometimes it's all the way up to world-devouring evils the heroes have to fight. Some, they have different types of characters. You know, there's some who are young and inexperienced, but hopeful that the world can be better. There's some that are old and bitter. There's some that are selfish with a heart of gold. There's some that are complete dumbasses. There's, they're all different, though. They have different writing styles, there are different lengths, like some are really long series, some are much shorter, 
and a, just a lot of stuff is different. There is only one popular TikTok fantasy book, and the more you people talk about the same shit over and over and over again, the more outsiders will think all of fantasy is like that. You know, it, it'll prevent them from checking it out at all. And fantasy, while it does have plenty of issues, don't get me wrong, I've talked about that before, it has plenty of issues, but it deserves better than what you're giving it right now. Like, whenever I think about how everything on Book Talk is not only the fucking same, but it's also always very bad, I'm reminded of a specific 4chan post about a guy who's obsessed with anime. I'll, I'll put it up on screen right now. And basically, you can read the whole thing, but basically he was obsessed with anime. It was the only media he consumed. And eventually he ran out of anime to watch, so he read The Call of Cthulhu and realized anime is terribly written. And yeah, he, he is correct. Because while there are some anime out there that I love, it is fundamentally a mistake and it does belong in the trash. Most of it is melodramatic garbage for children, unconcerned with characters acting like people or having worlds that are interesting or not having pedophilic undertones. Like I've lost count of shows I started that had neat setups only to devolve into unfunny harem bullshit after the first episode. A lot of anime that's good is stuff that is either aimed at an older audience like Berserk or it's stuff that just kind of acknowledges that it's really stupid and has fun with it, like a lot of shonen battle manga do that. And to the people who like the popular TikTok fantasy book, I ask you to try something new for your own sake, because it will open your eyes to what the world ho holds. I, I, I can't guarantee it, but I can almost guarantee it. Like, try some of the fantasy stuff that I mentioned earlier. You know, I rattled off all those book series. Try some of those. Not The Fifth Sorceress, that one's terrible, but the other ones, those all are pretty good. I like them in different ways for different reasons. One helps me appreciate the others more. I don't think I would truly love Orconomics as much as I do if I hadn't also read grimdark stuff like Game of Thrones beforehand. You should also try stuff outside of fantasy, like The Descent or The Expanse. The Descent I just read recently. It's an amazing book, and The Expanse is also fantastic book series that have a fantastic TV show adaptation. Hell, try classics like Dune or World War Z. Those are both great. Hell, just read other vapid young adult stuff that is honest about the fact that it's young adult. You know, it's honest about the fact that, yeah, this is written for middle school students and it's kind of stupid, but it's still enjoyable in its own way, you know? Read stuff like Vampire Academy or Shadow and Bone because neither of those are perfect, but they're fine enough stories. You know, there was effort there and they were just, they were kind of just doing their own thing. They weren't following a script every single time. Just, just read anything outside of what you're currently reading. Fucking read Onision's books. Those are terrible, but you can't say that they're exactly like everything else. Just really, just try something different at some point because either you like it and it expands your horizons or you don't like it and you gain a greater appreciation for the popular TikTok fantasy book that everyone keeps talking about over and over and over again, even though it's the same freaking book every time. Like, maybe you'll come away from it thinking, well, that was a little grim. I prefer my escapism to be full of sunshine and rainbows and genocide. Or maybe you think like, okay, that, that was a nice change of pace, but I'll get back to what I prefer now. Or maybe you'll be like the guy on 4chan and just realize that the stuff you've been obsessed with for several years was actual garbage and you can just move on and read actual good books. Now, was there anything good in Powerless? Like, a little bit. Just, just a little bit, but you know, it, it was there. And by that I mean, there's a scene at the end where Peyton kills the king, and that scene was pretty cool. Could have been better if it was like earlier on in the book, like she killed him and then went on the run and the story continued from there, so we weren't just wasting 500 fucking pages doing nothing. But, you know, needlessly stretching it out into a series doesn't affect the quality at all. And I will also say that at least it's not porn because most things that are popular on TikTok are literally just porn. So that, you know, that there's a little bit of good there, but that little bit of good is completely drowned out by everything else. It's like a single mouthful of water in an ocean of piss. Powerless Delende Est. Hello to everyone who watched this far. Not sure why you did that, but you know, thanks. Appreciate it. You're cool. Uh, all these names you see here, those are my patrons. Special thanks to my $10 and up patrons who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Ich bin Langweilig, Jalal Delul, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Proscriptions of Zhuo Jang, 
Rovi, Psych XS, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vevictus, Wesley, and Zenitech89. You're cool. I like you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this. If you want access to exclusive content as well as early access to my videos, and you want your name here, then consider donating over on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. You know, that works too. I don't have anything else to say here. I don't know why you're still watching. Goodbye.